The telescope opens a window into the sky that would otherwise still be closed for us. A window that reveals the vastness of the universe. A realization of how small and insignificant we are. And yet God sent his son to this earth to redeem us. What a God. This presentation will help us to appreciate the wonder of the cosmos. There are many beautiful nature scenes on our planet. And if you do not think these huge rocks in the Negev desert are impressive, thousands of tourists do. When I first saw these pillars of Solomon, as they are called, I was really moved. In awe I admired the Creator who made them. The reason why God gave us these majestic scenes, I think, is to take our minds off ourselves and meditate upon the one who made them, the Creator. Maybe you've heard the words of the song which says, Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. These rocks remind me of that song. Come with me to California and let me show you some of the biggest trees in the world. I hired a big American car and stopped at the entrance of an opening through this tree. I took this picture, I drove through the tree, and then I thought of the poem which says, I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. When I looked across the vastness of the Great Canyon, I fully realized how small I am and how big God really is. And then at night we look up and we see shining objects that boggle our minds. This is what the open star cluster, the Pleiades in Taurus, looks like through a modern telescope. Astronomers will tell you it's in M45. The Creator speaks to us through the faint cry of a baby and through the glories of this awe-inspiring nebula of Sagittarius. May you and I hear his caring voice speaking to us during our visit to the stars. But before we proceed deeper and deeper into the cosmos, we must first determine how many heavens there are. One, two or three. Or are there seven heavens, as some people say? When people are extremely happy, they say they are in the seventh heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 4. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. Now this is a typical example of Hebrew parallelism. Paul begins with the third heaven and he explains that the third heaven is where paradise is. Let's continue to allow the Bible to explain itself. Next, we want to know more about paradise and the third heaven. We find the answer in Revelation chapter 2 verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Where is the tree of life? Thus far we've discovered three things. The third heaven and the tree of life and the paradise are all in one location. Let's continue with our research and find out if the throne of God is also there. Revelation chapter 22 verses 1 and 2 The angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God, and out of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Where is this? This is heaven. We've made another discovery. The third heaven, paradise, the tree of life and the throne of God are all situated together. When Jesus comes, we will visit these celestial wonders far beyond the stars. Let us ask an Old Testament poet to give us his explanation of the throne of God in heaven. 
Psalms 103 verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. This is the same third heaven that Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 2 to 4. Somewhere beyond the stars there is a mighty creator who guides the galaxies through unlimited space. The Bible tells us the amazing story that one day, 2,000 years ago, the Creator came to our world and took upon Himself human flesh. Why? So that He could feel your pain and mine, so that He could experience loneliness and rejection and disappointments like you and I. In John 11:35, it says, Jesus wept. But then one Friday afternoon, the creatures of his own planet rejected him and crucified him on a cross. And through his death, the mighty creator of the cosmos became our sin-bearer and saviour. The act of recreation was a far greater display of love than was the act of creation. The Bible is filled with promises that the God of the stars will one day come and take us home with him. There he will explain to us all the mysteries and wonders of heaven. And he will also explain to us why he had to suffer so much during his earthly sojourn. The mystery of sin and suffering will at last be satisfactorily explained. Jesus says in John 14 verse 2, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You're looking at the powerful engines of one of the space rockets at Cape Kennedy. When I looked at this powerful giant, I thought of the second coming of Jesus. When he comes to take us to heaven, we will not leave this planet in one of these spaceships or in a space suit. Philippians 3.21 says that Jesus will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. 1 John 3 verse 2 Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The God of the stars is going to equip you and me with a body that will be able to travel through space faster than the speed of light. This is almost too good to be true. A new dynamic dimension of living awaits those who are now enjoying a meaningful relationship with Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. I want to assure you that we are serving a loving Heavenly Father who only wants to give us the best. He's not only going to show us the wonder of his mighty creation, he's going to reveal to us his loving kindness throughout eternity. One of these days we are going to see the Lord face to face. He's going to take us to the third heaven. Listen to what Job said in chapter 19 verses 26 and 27. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh will I see God. Myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. We've discovered that the Bible only speaks about three heavens. And before we proceed with our journey to the stars, let us first find out where the other two heavens are. As I read from Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11, I want you to tell me of which heaven the prophet speaks. It says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I send it. To which heaven does the prophet refer? He refers to the one from where our rain comes, the atmospheric heaven. 
Sometimes we get a lot of rain, sometimes less. Besides the atmospheric heaven or the first heaven, the Bible also speaks of another one. Let's read about it. Psalms 8 verses 3 and 4 When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Now which heaven is this, the first or the second one? This is the heaven into which we will probe today, the second heaven. It lies between the atmospheric heaven, the first one, and the third heaven where God's throne is. Long before the new powerful telescopes penetrated into the mysteries of the nebula of Orion, the Bible made this statement. Can you tie the Pleiades together or loosen the bonds that hold Orion? Job chapter 38 verse 31. Somehow God wants us to focus on Orion. You are looking at Orion. The three bottom stars are called the belt of Orion and the three top ones are called his sword. What would you say the purpose of a belt is? Well, to hold things together. But astronomers recently discovered that Alnitok, one of the three stars in the belt, is moving away. 3,500 years ago, God asked Job, Can you loosen the bonds of Orion? Only recently, scientists discovered that God was right. The belt of Orion is loosening. This is what Orion looks like through a modern telescope. It'll take you 600 years to get there if you travel at the speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. The light of huge suns in the vicinity as well as different elements in the gas causes the beautiful colors in this nebula. It gives the effect of a million rainbows that are intertwined. Can you see something like a horse head? At the bottom of the nebula there is a tremendous chasm. Would you like to guess how big this dark hole is? According to the great astronomer Larkin, it is 6,750 billion miles in diameter. Larkin continues and says, These negatives reveal the opening and interior of a cavern so stupendous that our entire solar system, including the orbit of Neptune, could be lost therein. In all ordinary telescopes, the nebula looks like a flat surface. I've watched it since the days of my youth in many telescopes of many powers, but never dreamt that the central region is the mouth of a colossal cave. It is like looking in a door and to the rear of a cave deep within glittering nebulosity. The chasm is the most beautiful object visible to human sight. Pillars, columns, walls, facades, bulwarks, stalactites and stalagmites are within deeps of deeps. They glow and shine superbly with pearly light. Smith and Chambers' book on astronomy, page 150, has this to say. To attempt even at a guess as to what this light is would be presumptuous. No astronomer can tell you what is the mysterious light that is coming from the center of that opening. By the way, this is also the birthplace of new stars. And then a last quote from a local astronomer. Isn't it possible that the light that baffles astronomers comes from the light of the holy city with its streets of gold, its pearly gates and its rainbow? Just look at this celestial wonder. It's called the Crab Nebula in Taurus. How does a nebula come about? When a star becomes nova, it means that it literally explodes in a titanic release of energy. So the crab nebula that you see here used to be a star. In AD 1054, it destroyed itself in this supernova explosion. Chinese astronomers witnessed this great eruption. It was so spectacular that it could even be seen during daytime. Don't you think this nebula looks like a dumbbell? Well, it is called Dumbbell. It is among the most dramatic and beautiful of all celestial bodies. Our God loves beauty and he wants us too to be beautiful in character. 
If you travel at the speed of light, it would take you 5,000 years to get to the Ring Nebula. It is invisible to the naked eye, but through a telescope it looks like a ghostly smoke ring comprising of gas. Its temperature of 100,000 degrees Fahrenheit causes the beautiful colors in the nebula. This one was caused when this hot star puffed off its outer layers. You're looking at the awe-inspiring nebula of Trifid in Sagittarius. Psalms 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, the beautiful light and colors we see come from God himself. It is especially designed for your delight by a considerate, loving Heavenly Father. The Sombrero Nebula contains more than a hundred billion stars and it's some 30 million light years away. Isaiah 40 verse 26 invites us to lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. By the way, God knows your name, your address, your telephone number, and he knows how much hair you have, and he also knows your heart. With a 200-inch telescope, astronomers saw the Lagoon Nebula in the constellation of Sagittarius. It is a giant cloud of gas and dust. Today it's red, but some astronomers predict that it'll change to blue. It reminds me of a great God who can change our darkest night into the brightest day. This brilliant star is known as Alpha Origae. Can you see the blue veil? This nebulosity is due to the presence of vast clouds of gas. This giant blue star causes the glow. Just look at this open star cluster M46 in the constellation of Puppis. Can you spot the planetary nebula? Jesus, the creator of all this beauty, left it behind to come and die for you and me on a lonely cross in order to save us. Oh, what love! While you're looking at the splendor of the Rosetta Nebula of Monoceros, I want to read you a statement on the origin of the universe. Psalms 33 verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Hebrews 11 verse 3 By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Exodus 20 verse 8 tells us that God has given us a weekly institution to remind us that he is the creator. Please give him the honor that he deserves. Our Milky Way is not the only one in the universe. If you travel beyond it, you will discover a very big universe. The final message in the Bible to the inhabitants of this planet is found in Revelation 14 where it says, Worship him who made the heavens, the earth and the sea and the springs of water, verse 7. Just look at this interesting galaxy called the Spiral Galaxy. It contains billions of huge suns, much bigger than our own. The creator who made all this came down personally to our planet and created the first man, Adam. A mighty telescope spotted this whirlpool galaxy with its 60 billion stars. It is 14 million light years away from us. The companion galaxy in the constellation of Usa Major is an extension of of this spiral arm. Genesis 1 verse 1 In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Some time ago in the distant past our mighty God created these two galaxies in Usa Major M81 and M82. What a creator! People, just look at this. It's a galaxy. Each of the 100 million galaxies has its own individuality. God made every one of them unique. And you too are made unique. Don't try to be someone else. 
This is an unbelievable celestial scene. You are looking at a field of galaxies. Just imagine the amount of energy God used in creating them. They are two million light years apart. John 1 verse 3 says, Through him, that's Christ, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. While you're looking at the innumerable amount of stars in this Milky Way in the constellation of Sagittarius, I'm reading the words of that beautiful song which says, How big is God? How big and wide is vast domain? To try and tell these lips can only start. He's big enough to rule his mighty universe, yet small enough to live within my heart. One clear evening, David looked up into the starry heavens and experienced its majestic vastness. And then he wrote the following words under inspiration. Psalms 8 verses 3 and 4. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You're looking at one big orange ring which covers billions upon billions of kilometers in a vast expanse. This is the Helix Nebula in Aquarius. Why is God mindful of you and me? Is there something special in us? Not really. But there is something special in His heart for us. Something that's called love. It is told that the late President Roosevelt and a friend, William Beebe, usually went outside before saying goodnight to each other, and then they started searching for the faint glow of Andromeda. The one who saw it first would cry out, There is the spiral galaxy of Andromeda. It is one of a hundred million galaxies. It has a hundred billion suns, and each sun is larger than ours. And then Theodore Roosevelt would remark with a smile, I think we are small enough. Let's go to bed. Fritz Kahn says, according to the present estimate, the nebula of Andromeda is about 1,500,000 light years away. This comes from the book The Design of the Universe, page 165. Let us remain small. Amos 5, verse 8 says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. Earlier we discovered that God is loosening the bonds of Orion. But listen to what Job 38 verse 31 says about the seven stars or the Pleiades. Can you tie the Pleiades together? Of Orion God spoke of loosening, but of these seven stars he says they are tied together by some kind of bond. Does science confirm it? Robert Trumpler says that they are moving in a southeasterly direction like birds. They have made more than 2,500 recordings of the seven stars and discovered that they stick together as if some invisible hand holds them together. Elliot Gore in Studies in Astronomy says their combined movement indicates that they are tied to each other by some physical factor. When I read about this fantastic discovery, I thought of the Bible that also has magnetic power to keep me close to God. It is so easy to go out of orbit without His drawing power in my life. Let's look at a few reliable biblical facts about our planet. About 3,000 years ago, before modern science discovered that our world was round, Solomon knew it. You are looking at a picture of the earth taken from the moon. Proverbs 8 verse 27 says, When he fixed the heavens firm, I was there, when he drew a ring on the surface of the deep. And then Isaiah 40 verse 22 says, He lives above the circle of the earth. He has stretched out the heavens like a cloth, spread them like a tent for men to live in. The last part of this verse speaks about the thin layer of atmosphere that surrounds our planet. Listen again. He has stretched out the heavens like a cloth. He speaks here about the atmospheric heavens. Spread them like a tent for men to live in. 
We cannot survive without the stent of oxygen in which we live. To me, this is fantastic. Astronomy underlines the authenticity of the Bible. More than 3,000 years before the first scientists discovered that our solar system moves in orbit, the Bible knew it. Listen to what David wrote 3,000 years ago about the orbit of our sun through the skies. Psalms 19 verse 6 says, It, the sun, rises at the one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. 3,500 years ago, Job 22.14 spoke of the rim of the heavens. Isn't that fantastic? After the Americans launched Apollo 8, they produced this six-cent stamp with the words, In the beginning, God. For the first time, the world saw a picture of our world suspended in space on thousands of envelopes. 3,500 years ago, the book of Job knew all about our earth being suspended in space. This most baffling heavenly body that the radio telescope picked up was subsequently called a quasar. Concerning its energy output, the astronomers discovered the following. It produces more energy than a hundred large galaxies. Hebrews 1.3 says, Sustaining all things by his powerful word. When astronomers studied the Hercules star cluster M13, they discovered that the splendor of one star differs from that of another. Let me read you an astonishing verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 41. It says, Star differs from star in splendor. These wonderful astronomical facts in the Bible help us to place all our confidence in this reliable, inspired book. The purpose of the study of astronomy is to discover a personal Savior who cares for you and me. The heavens declare his glory. Sir John Herschel wrote, All human discoveries seem to be made for the purpose of confirming more strongly the truths contained in sacred scriptures. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, he took a miracle of love and grace. In the early 1960s, astronomers were scanning the edge of our known universe when they made the most dramatic discovery of the age. This most baffling heavenly body that the radio telescope picked up was subsequently called a quasar. Concerning its energy output, the astronomers discovered the following. Can you grasp it? More energy than a hundred galaxies the size of Andromeda. I'm sure you would like to see a quasar. There it is. They are the most distant objects known to man. This big quasar is 10 billion light years away from us. Up to date they've discovered a few hundred of them. Scientists have not yet come to a final conclusion as to what exactly these quasars are. Some say they could be universes beyond our own universe. Could it be that each of these tiny specks that you see contain macro galaxies? If you can grasp the distance between our tiny speck of dust, our planet Earth, and the rest of the universe, then you will be able to measure and understand God's love for you. Psalms 103 verses 10 to 12 He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. If you can grasp the distance of 10 billion light years, you will be able to understand God's forgiving love for you. One thing that strikes you when you study astronomy is the fact that these heavenly bodies spin in orbit around other heavenly bodies, and they never clash. God's hand keeps them 
on their correct orbit. It is only us humans who lose direction in life and spin out of orbit. Thousands of people have no direction in life. They are wandering stars in a dark night. Maybe I'm talking about you or somebody you know. Maybe your days are meaningless, disappearing like shooting stars, like falling leaves of autumn. Or could it be that the many disappointments of life have made you a cold individual like winter snow? I have a message for you. This insignificant little pool of muddy water in which you're looking is reflecting the majesty of a mighty mountain. And this is what God wants to do for you and me. He wants to reflect His image in my little muddled up life and in yours. Let us allow Him to pour out His peace in our troubled hearts so that the majesty of His character may be reflected in us. What is the message of the stars? The poet answers, How big is God? How big and wide is vast domain? To try and tell these lips can only start. He's big enough to rule his mighty universe, yet small enough to live within my heart. Please invite the God of the stars to come into your heart and make him the bright star of your dark life. Thank you, Francois. This was wonderful. I trust that you have enjoyed this lecture as much as I have. Please close your eyes for prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the beauty of the stars, the planets and the moons. You are indeed a wonderful creator. May we daily allow you to recreate our lives into your image. In Jesus' name, Amen. Don't miss part two of this wonderful subject.